Hi, everybody. Welcome to week two. This is uh, this is Daryl. Uh, I apologize that the last week we, we weren't able to do the, the live presentation and I had to put up a, a, a previous video. Uh, I think that previous video covered everything pretty well. I think you guys got the information, but I, I hate not being able to uh, uh, interact with everybody and, and meet all the new students and so forth. So it was kind of disappointing for me. I don't know. Uh, you guys really didn't know what to expect, and I'm sure uh, it was confusing, and I apologize. But things seem to be going well. The class seems to be settling in really well. I, I thought that uh, you guys did a great job in the discussion board, and then uh, I was able to grade pretty much all of the um, um, TED Talk uh, reviews that, that got submitted last night. Some of you didn't get them in on time, and we're going to give you a little bit of extra time. So I, I, I kept that assignment open. You uh, didn't quite make it by Sunday night, but those of you that did turn it in, I was able to get you uh, uh, graded and get your feedback. And, and I was very pleased with what I saw. Everybody's doing really, really well. So um, uh, I think that uh, this class is really gonna be pretty, pretty sharp and we're gonna do pretty well. This week is much more creative and fun and challenging. Uh, Instead of just watching someone else's videos, we're gonna, we're gonna dive in and start making our own. And we're gonna start working on our main project. There is a main project for the entire month, uh, a main presentation that you're gonna do. And we're not gonna work, we're not gonna do that presentation this week. We're gonna start planning that presentation. As we learned last week, we don't wanna jump in ahead of things and start making slides too early. We wanna. We want to plan things out and know exactly what we're doing before we actually start making multimedia. So in that phase, uh, I want to give you the main assignment this week and uh, the, 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 the task for this week is to create a plan. So this is a planning phase. This is the pre-production era of, the, of making your main presentation. And then you'll start on actually making the presentation next week. But there is still some multimedia create because this week's discussion board isn't just a type discussion, it's an audio discussion. So uh, I'm gonna ask you guys to uh, use your voice and tell us stories and it's gonna be really fun. It's a little bit complicated. I wanna explain everything so you understand it. But once you know what the assignment is, it's a really fun assignment and it's a really great way to interact with your classmates and so forth. So um, let's get going. Uh, the uh, reading for this week starts in on the second book that we uh, have assigned, Slideology. I hope that nobody's having trouble getting access to the books. I know that um, uh, the O'Reilly books are not as versatile as we'd hoped. We wanted them to be able to be downloaded onto your phones and, and you actually have to be connected to a browser to read it. But uh, anybody who's having trouble accessing the books should get a hold of me and, and we have uh, various other ways of, of getting that information uh, as, well, as well as we can. I know the number one request is for an audio book of, of the things, but that doesn't exist. But we have other ways of, of, of getting hold of that information. And uh, one of the chapters uh, that we assigned in the, in the other book, uh, Slideology, to you this week, is Nancy's first attempt, Nancy Duarte's first attempt to define what presentations are good at, what they can do. That's called the five theses of the power of a presentation. So she thinks very hard about this notion of what she calls a presentation. And we're defining it very broadly. We're not saying presentation equals PowerPoint. Presentation is any kind of effort to persuade. And most in the, in, in the modern era, presentation has moved beyond PowerPoint to mostly be video. Most of the presentations you're ever gonna see are gonna be, you know, uh, video presentations. They'll probably be on YouTube or something like that. Uh, which is not to say that you can't make videos out of uh, PowerPoint presentations. We're gonna explore all of those means as well. But this, um, in, in, in the, the new reading that we've assigned, uh, some of the things that she tells us about the five theses of the power of presentation, we've already heard a little bit of before. She, she, she hits the same notes a lot of times. One is that the audience is your primary goal that you don't just make generic presentations that you know, have to know who your audience is and you have to hone in on them and you make presentations for a specific audience. And therefore your job as a creative presenter or as a, a creator of presentations 
is to know who your audience is so you can know how to best connect with them. You need to know what kinds of things they're interested in. You have to know what their uh, associations and, and tastes are so that your references, your jokes, your illustrations will resonate with them. And it, it doesn't just happen by accident. It's a matter of research that you have to do in pre-production. Learn who that audience is, learn how it is you're going to uh, ring their bell, how to connect with them. Uh, and we want to uh, move people. She wants presentations to be sort of viral. So they're great ways of spreading ideas. And we want presentations to be very focused. We don't want to take a lot of ideas and throw them in a presentation. We want to have a presentation focus on one idea, hone it very, be very quickly. Presentations are better the shorter they are, the more focused they are. And when they do that, they then concentrate people's attention on a particular notion. And that's the way they go viral is that they are very specifically spreading a cause or, 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 or selling a product or, or uh, uh, putting someone's uh, brand forward. So the thing that you've chosen to do, you hone in specifically on that and you don't have a lot of extraneous information and they're much more powerful for being that concentrated. And we want to make them as visual as we can. Uh, we're concentrating because we're in an online class on using your voice. But presentations, when you do them live, your entire being is involved. You have to, you have to think about uh, how you're uh, being perceived by the other people in the crowd, uh, how to use your, uh, not only your voice, but your body language, uh, how to keep eye contact, your facial expressions, all of these things matter. And even in pre-recorded presentations, if you're going to be on camera, uh, oftentimes you're gonna be using, you know, very close in talking head footage. Your facial expressions uh, matter a lot. That's the human connection. And so you as the presenter matter a lot in terms of connecting with the audience. And you wanna, you, you're the person who's spreading these ideas. But once you're using your voice and you're telling them what you wanna tell them, you also wanna use the visuals that are available in the presentation, the slides, the video, whatever you have that's accompanying your voice to help them see what you're saying. You want to, the visuals to help tell the story. Don't depend on them to tell the story. Uh, don't, don't think that just making a statement, you know, put, putting some text on a slide is better than talking. Talking is better than text by itself. But text and talking is better than one without the other. And visuals and text plus talking is the best of all. That's what Nancy kind of is trying to drive us at. So she wants us to make visual statements. And so think about the visuals in your presentation as part of the communication. You're not just making pretty pictures. You're not just putting something up there to occupy the space. You're not decorating the screen. You're actually communicating. So practice design, not decoration. And in a presentation, you have a couple of relationships that you need to think about. If you're presenting live and you're there and the audience is there, then the relationship between you and the audience is actually a little bit fluid. You have the ability uh, during a live presentation to read the room, to know that uh, if the energy is sagging, you can, you can pump it up. Or if you're losing your audience, you know, put out more evidence. Uh, so if you can, if you can read how the audience is perceiving you, you have the ability to adjust on the fly. But when we make pre-recorded presentations, we don't have that kind of benefit of knowing how it's going over. So the, the, the relationship that we have to pay attention to in that case is between the audio and the visual. Are they complimenting each other? Are they staying in the moment? Are the visuals promoting what you have to say? Uh, is, this, is the visual pace moving fast enough. This is the number one mistake that a lot of students make. You make a PowerPoint, you're talking for four minutes, and you think you can have three slides. Well, no one wants to see a slide for a minute and a half. Uh, you, should edit, you should make yourself a general rule that your slides 
change every 20 seconds at the maximum or the, or the minimum. I don't know which that would be. But, uh, um, you know, you want, you want to have movement in your slides uh, 20 seconds or less. So if you're making a three or four minute presentation, know that you have to have at least nine or 12 slides and more is better. So uh, don't create complicated slides and hang on them forever. That is boring and uh, you don't wanna be boring. So uh, those are some of the aspects of the eco, of the, um, uh, what Nancy defined in her first book as what she thought presentations were good for. Uh, and what we're dealing with this week is planning for a presentation. So an interesting thing that uh, is in the reading this week also is her notion of the presentation ecosystem. And she likens this to the way other things are created. Uh, we're very familiar with the filmmaking process and, and often, you know, video game making process, et cetera, where you go through three distinct phases, pre-production, production, and post-production. Pre-production is, is before the things are actually started to be created, but you have all kinds of decisions that you have to make. Production is, is creating the actual media and post-production is, is where it gets assembled, put together. And uh, depending on the media and the complexity, uh, various phases are uh, more or less important. Uh, we, we gained this system from the classic notion of Hollywood filmmaking. Hollywood filmmaking always had pre-production, production, post-production post phase. And part of this was the fact that filmmaking is so expensive. And in the old days, before you, we had digital video, it was also a little bit um, um, risky because whatever you shot that day, you had to get processed chemically. We shot film instead of uh, with computers. And so you, you wouldn't know until the next day exactly what you had. And if you didn't get the shot you needed, you'd have to set it up and shoot it again. And because production is the most expensive part of making a film, you're, gaining, you're getting all your people put together and you're spending most of your money at that time. You wanna plan it out meticulously. So you take care of all that in pre-production. Pre-production is where you write the script and you hire the actors and you hire the crew and you, you promote the film and you build the sets and, and, you, and you, most of all, you plan the shooting schedule so that your production goes very quickly. And then in shooting, you do nothing but create film. And then in post-production, you can start to edit the film, you can work on the audio, you can do promotion, you can do other things like that. And so that filmmaking process uh, makes a lot of sense and it covers over to other areas. And uh, the presentation ecosystem has a very similar vein and there's very, the, there are, are tasks that need to be accomplished in pre-production that if you don't do that, if you start making the presentation too early, you haven't actually uh, asked and a answered these questions for yourself and it causes problems. So I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about the presentation ecosystem as Nancy Duarte defines it. And uh, rather than being uh, broken into pre, uh, uh, production, production, and post-production. Her phase is, is has three different uh, avenues. The message phase, the visual story phase, and the delivery phase. Now each one of these has their own pre-production areas and they have their production and post-production areas. So I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about what each one of these things deals with. And the message phase is figuring out what you have to say. And so the very first thing you have to do, know that you're not delivering the same message to everybody, that all audiences, all stories, uh, all messages that you have uh, are, are specific and particular. You have to figure out who the audience is. Who are you talking to and why? How are you going, uh, you know, what do you, what do you have to say to uh, affect them? What kinds of things are they interested in? What kind of stories, what kind of jokes? What kinds of references? You know, you, you, you could be very um, streetwise, 
But if you're talking to a bunch of academics, it goes over their head. You can be very academic, but if you're talking to third graders, it goes over their heads. So you want to meet your audience with the uh, references and jokes and, and uh, uh, metaphors that match um, what your audience is thinking about. And you have to know who they are in order to do that. And that's a matter of research, really. Once you know who you're talking to, you have to figure out what you want to say. And this term, ideation, you may not have heard of it uh, very much. It's uh, the act of generating ideas. You haven't heard this term, even though it's very, 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 very important, because we use a different term to refer to it. We use the notion brainstorming. Brainstorming is just kind of a metaphor in and of itself. It's the notion that there's some kind of meteorological system in the back of your head and that uh, if you create a storm, uh, you can make it rain, that, that the ideas will come forth. Uh, but generating ideas is a very um, personal and uh, uh, mysterious task, especially for artists. And most people have different processes. Some people may maybe go off and sketch or daydream, or if you're a musician, you may just sit at a piano and, and uh, hit notes and, and, and try different things. But if you're trying to generate ideas, you have to figure out the way that you become most creative. Lots of people have notebooks, they sketch in notebooks, they write words or doodles down, and that helps. So you have to figure out what process works for you. As you're starting to work with computers, there are computer tools that are helpful. Um, some things like gathering visual ideas. Uh, there are websites like Pinterest that can help. Uh, there are there's software that can help. Uh, we're going to talk about something called mind mapping that allows you to free associate uh, words visually. But brainstorming is a process that's very necessary for every project, and it's something that people don't do enough of. So. I'm gonna encourage you, whatever brainstorming you're doing now, push it a little bit further. It will make you a better artist. Uh, the more you work at it, the better you go. And uh, for a lot of people, um, brainstorming is like searching Google. They get lazy and once they get one result, you know, the first result, they just stop right there. Well, you know, if you do a search in Google, there's usually a million hits. Now you don't have time to go through all the million choices, but you're a much better, more responsible artist or Googler if you go beyond the first choice, if you take a little bit of time to dig into those options, because there are a lot of them. And the same goes for ideas. Uh, if you keep pushing at it, oftentimes the first idea is not the best. Sometimes it is. But you can't guarantee that. And until you go through a brainstorming process, you're not going to get the full result of the ideas that are available to you. So I encourage everyone to uh, spend more time than they feel comfortable brainstorming. Pushing it a little bit further always helps. And once you've gathered all these ideas, you have to then start making sense of them. And so the writing process starts as a kind of editing process, looking over all your different ideas and deciding what works, what doesn't work, what could be included, what might not be included. And then we don't want to just gather these as disparate elements, but we want to tell a story. Remember, the best way to capture someone's attention isn't just to throw a whole bunch of disparate facts at them, but is to tell a story. And the way you tell a story is that you put your information in context. You've got a beginning, middle, and end. You've got to have movement from where you start where you define what you're talking about and move through the complications to a conclusion. Uh, that's not always a fictional story. It just can be any kind of story, but there has to be a movement from uh, um, a wider amount of options to a narrowing of the way. And that, if you can tell it in a way that the audience goes along with you, is a compelling narrative that encompasses all of your ideas. So to, to get the writing down, 
Uh, maybe you want to write it down in Word. Maybe you want to write it down in a notebook. Uh, if you work on paper, you're eventually probably going to go to a computer because you're going to be working in the computer. In, a, in our age uh, nowadays, uh, the phone or the, the, uh, the tablet or the computer, everything can be done at once. You can do all your pre-production there, you can do the production there, and you can do the, the, the finished work there as well. So um, the old days where pre-production, pre production, and post-production were separated in time, get a little bit confused nowadays because you can actually be shooting footage before you get ideas, but you want to follow these processes in somewhat of an order in order to clarify your ideas and make your project make sense for you. So in writing, putting the thing together, you want to assemble all of those elements to tell a story. And once you know what you have to say, then you want to know how do you accompany it? How do you best sell that story? And again, there's a planning phase. You can go out, you can collect images, and that's where you know uh, mood boards and, and um, sites like Pinterest come in handy. Uh, you can collect images. You can collect images in, uh, you know, you're on your computer, uh, different software. Uh, a lot of notes software allow you to uh, collect images as well as uh, text notes and so forth. Uh, and then you can start to sketch things out. You can, you can uh, plan out your story and storyboards. You can use visual tools such as mind maps to associate uh, words and uh, connections between images and text and figure out what you want to say. Now, there are a couple of aspects to visual thinking. One is figuring out the style of what you want to say. You know, what is the medium that you can use that will appeal to the audience? You know, um, uh, you want to use visual, you want to use photographs, you want to use digital art, you want to use video game art, you want to use stills from movies. Depends on your audience. If your audience is very movie, uh, savvy, then movie clips might be a way to connect with them. If your audience is very va video game uh, saturated, then maybe those are the illustrations that are going to get their attention and, and, and uh, make sense. But it isn't just a matter of picking any game theme footage. It has to be the thing that is the proper metaphor for what you have to say at the time. The visual has to match what you're saying. And that's the whole point of selecting a visual is to keep the audience involved in the story as it exists as is being told. Another aspect of visual thinking is taking information and putting it into a context that makes sense. That often involves things like charts and graphs or infographics. And if you are the kind of person who can take complex information and put it into a visual model that helps people to understand it for the first time, you're going to be highly employed for the rest of your life because it's a very valuable skill. Not everybody can do it. And if you're the kind of person that can do it, then that's going to be something that you want to make part of your brand of who you are and what you do because people are always going to be around to hire you to do that. Uh, we want to think about graphic design, not that we all have to become graphic designers, but that if you think about it, all of us through our lives have been messaged to by graphic design, and that language becomes something that is very much a part of us. And in creating slides that exist in time that actually have to move fairly quickly, you're a, you are tasked with creating messages that the audience can grasp very quickly. You don't want to make complex uh, uh, photo montages or uh, intricate statements that take a long time to decipher. You want to create slides that can be instantly understood and so that people stay in the moment of the flowing narrative. And I like to think, you, uh, I like to think of it as the, the signage that uh, graphic designers have to do for um, roadside signs along a highway. If you're driving along a highway, sometimes at 60, 70, 80 miles an hour, you've only got so much time to look at the signs on the side of the road and make sense of them. And it's vital information. It's an off-ramp, trouble ahead. Whatever you need to know, if there's a sign on the side of the road, it's probably information you need to know. 
And you need to be able to, to decipher it very quickly because you're moving by very fast. So what do they do in graphic design for the signage? They use heavy fonts with great contrast so that people don't have to uh, strain their eyes to, to, to decipher them. They use fewer words, uh, as few as possible to get the message across, uh, but they don't uh, make it a puzzle so that someone has to see something and then wonder what it is they saw. But if, they're, if they can use symbols to communicate, so much the better. Now you guys have become very familiar with this in texting. You started to use symbols and, and uh, uh, text shortcuts as a way of typing very quickly uh, because you're moving through time very fast. And uh, slide projections are the same way. You wanna use that graphic designer sense of common understandings, common language, common symbols to help tell the story, uh, get the message across very fast. Uh, and graphic design is also about creating things that are clean, that, that are separated, that we don't put text just straight over photographs. We might put plates behind them so that there's some contrast there. Uh, the things that students do a lot that I hate to see is uh, text straight over a photograph such that there's no contrast and you cannot read the text and you've now ruined the photograph as well. Uh, if you're going to put text on a photograph, make sure there is some kind of uh, translucent plate there so that you're getting enough contrast that people can actually read the text. Uh, and motion graphic, motion design is an important part of uh, creative presentations. Now, when I say motion design, you're probably going to think of the gazillion transitions that something like PowerPoint ships with. But um, that's not really what I mean. The transitions are actually irrelevant. You know, that's Microsoft or whoever made the software showing off their creativity, but it actually is separating people from your content, which is in the slides. So the transitions aren't important. You wanna use very quick, fast, unobtrusive transitions. Uh, cuts, slides, pushes, trans, uh, dissolves. And, you know, don't go for a lot of that fancy stuff that, that Microsoft puts in there. It's just gimmickry. But the motion design that is important is things that keep people in the moment. For instance, uh, there might be an important time when you're gonna have five bullet points on a slide. Uh, but bringing in those five bullet points all at once at the beginning of that slide is going to create a problem because the audience is going to want to try to read the entire thing they read ahead. And as you're talking, you're addressing the various points of the slide. But it's very simple to start on a blank screen and slide in point one as you start to talk about it and leave point one on by itself until you get to the point of your narrative when you're talking about point two, maybe eight seconds longer, and then slide uh, the number, bullet point number two can slide in just in moment. The whole point is to use motion design to keep people in the moment, that they're not trying to read ahead or they're not getting away from the narrative, but that you're subtly using the pushing of information to give people information exactly at the point that they need it, not too early, not too late because either one of those has the chance of making the audience get off of the, the, the flow of the narrative from the voiceover. So motion design can move us through and control how people perceive these slides. And it's an important uh, way of sort of orchestrating the movement. The third leg of the uh, Eco, uh, presentation ecosystem is delivery because there are lots of ways to receive a presentation. Uh, the, the main one we've been dwelling on in this class is between uh, being there in person and, and not being there. Because this is an online class, we can't deal with live presentations. We can talk about it, we can show pictures of it, but the uh, most important aspect of, of human uh, contact in a presentation is going to be you in the room. And thinking about what are those circumstances is part of what you have to decide. 
So probably one of the most common presentations you're going to encounter in your professional career is the business meeting. You know, uh, there's a decision that has to be made. Uh, they schedule a, uh, a, a meeting for an hour in a conference room three days from now. There are going to be eight people in the room. You're delivering the presentation. This is a common uh, thing that happens. So the presentation you make for that room, you have to think about the circumstances. You're not delivering to a large crowd, you're delivering to a handful of people. And the people that have been selected for that meeting are people who have particular job functions. There might be um, the project manager who's concerned about the schedule. There might be the accountant who's concerned about the budget. There might be the programmer who's concerned about the, uh, um, the, the, the demands on uh, the to uh, time or what has to be accomplished. It might be the art director who's concerned about how it looks. And each one of these people are, are, are people you might need to address individually in your presentation as you're addressing the problem. But typically, if a decision needs to be made in a, uh, um, a business meeting, you're making a short presentation to just lay out all the options and clarify everything for everyone. You're not going to you're not going to take up an entire hour with your presentation. You should be done in four or five minutes. Um, and in a, in a typical conference room, you know it's an eight by ten room, uh, ten by twelve. You're sitting around a large table. Maybe you're you have a laptop on the table, and that's what people are looking at. Maybe you have a a, a, a flat screen TV on the wall, and you're projecting to it, and that's what people are looking at. But as you're running that presentation, you're basically probably standing at your spot in the table talking to those people. It's a very intimate kind of presentation. Very different from the TED Talks where you're on a stage, you're looking at an entire auditorium full of people. Different way of projecting yourself, different way of dealing with the audience. And, and so each prospect has its own issues that you have to deal with. Uh, and and if it's not live, then there are other things that you have to deal with. What is the method of delivery? And for a lot of us with these online presentations, we're starting to create videos that get presented, streamed across the web. Uh, YouTube is gonna be uh, featured prominently here just because it's probably the main way that we deliver videos to each other. But more and more, you're gonna deliver videos in Instagram, you're gonna deliver TikTok and Facebook. Uh, as well as websites. So you have an awful lot of options for where you're creating these things and you have issues to do with each one. Each one has their own streaming problems or interface issues or um, uh, ways that they're accessed or audiences that deal with them. And so as you're figuring out what your presentation is, you have to figure out how the audience is going to receive this. And, and that has a lot to do with what you create. If you're creating a video that you put on YouTube, you may have created it on your laptop, 15 inch laptop and the slides look great on, that, on your computer, but someone's gonna watch it on their phone at four or five inches. So now you have to ask yourself, do my slides scale down? Do they look good at four or five inches as good as they did it at a 15 inch on my screen? Or maybe they're gonna go the other direction. They're gonna be up on a, a big uh, wall screen, you know, 50 or 60 inch LCD. And are your, scales gonna, are your slides gonna scale up? Did you pick high resolution images so that they don't dissolve into pixelization as they grow big? So all of these things are things that in pre-production, you can ask yourself these questions, you can, you can resolve those issues and not have to deal with them as problems after the fact. Now, most of us as artists work our way into uh, uh, wisdom through failure, which means that all of these things I'm talking about right now, you're going to screw up on something, and then you're going to find that out after the fact. And then that's going to hurt you, and that means the next time you do this presentation, you won't make that mistake. That's the way of wisdom, you know. You burn your hand on the stove once, and then you don't ever do it again, but you have to have to go through that pain the first time. Now I can sit here as your teacher 
and try to tell you every trap that you're going to fall into, you won't remember it, you won't think about it, but you will make these mistakes. And that's the importance of doing a lot of these presentations in college. You want to make all your mistakes in college. You don't want to do uh, that many of them in, in your uh, career where you're, you're working for a paycheck because you're going to have to justify that paycheck every day. And uh, making a lot of mistakes uh, doesn't help that. Uh, another thing about uh, delivery is that the circumstances are going to change. The technology is going to change. We're going to have interactive machinery that uh, people have to navigate. So you may have to deal with um, presentation systems that uh, work as live kiosks or something. Uh, we also know that uh, AR, augmented reality, and VR, virtual reality are coming. Uh, those may be a way that people get lots of presentations. You may have to start thinking about creating presentations in a 360 degree space for a headset. Uh, and one thing you're gonna do as an artist is think about the project you're working on now with the technology you're working on now, knowing that you're going forward. So video keeps getting higher and higher in resolution. You know, we started off with little tiny videos on the web and uh, um, high def came in 20 years ago and uh, now everything is 4K. You can shoot 4K on your, on your uh, iPhone or your, your Android phone as well, I'm sure. Um, but 4K video is huge and it involves a lot of processing power and it slows things down, but scales up and looks terrific. And perhaps if we start going into things like virtual reality, 4K video becomes much more important to have that resolution. So knowing that in the future, different kinds of uh, um, technology requirements are gonna, come, are, are gonna be in place, we can, none of us can know the future. You know, I talk about virtual reality, we've been talking about virtual reality really for 20 years. I still don't know for sure if it's gonna catch on. It may have always been a fad forever. But if it catches on and is the principal way that people communicate with each other, you have to be able to work with that as a creative professional. And just knowing what your assets can and cannot do is part of that. It's knowing how to future-proof your work. You create the work for the project you have now, but with a notion that, you know, what will I need to do so that people can watch this a year from now, two years from now, five years from now? And uh, that's part of what you keep an eye on. The last aspect of delivery is an odd one. We used to call it paper. I probably should stop using this term right now. Uh, uh, we can also say it's the leap behind. If we were doing a presentation live in a theater, a TED Talk type presentation, and we were trying to persuade someone of something, uh, we would make a great presentation and we would persuade them. We would get the audience to the point where they'd say yes. But that presentation runs in time and then it ends. And you cannot control what happens after the presentation within the presentation. So the lead behind is a way of continuing the conversation. Typically, if you're delivering a live presentation, you might create a brochure or a business card or, or uh, some kind of handout that's in the same design style as the slides. And so once you've convinced audiences with your presentation, you can hand out the pamphlets and that'll be the way that they can contact you or they can send you a check or sign up for your cause or say yes or do whatever. The lead behind is a way to continue that conversation. No matter how persuasive you've been in your presentation, don't think that if on the last slide you leave your phone number or your email address or whatever way of contacting you that someone is going to suddenly get out a piece of paper and write that down. That's never going to happen, ever. And when they watch the presentation, they watch the presentation. Presentation ends. All right, whatever that number on the last screen was, they don't have it anymore. So you have to provide it. You have to give that information there. And if you're doing this digitally, then that then it matters what the chrome of your presentation is. What is on the web page? What is around or next to that YouTube video? Uh, you may need to add some text. You know, you need, well, you need to be able to 
to give them your email address or a link to you or a link to the cause or a link to the purchase point. That's the leave behind. And it's part of the thinking because it's how do you continue that presentation? The presentation is going to do its job and persuade. But if there's a, uh, if there's a, um, something that has to happen beyond that, if someone has to engage to say yes, to buy your product, to hire you, to, to join the cause, et cetera, then figure out what that connection is and make sure that it's there with the presentation because that's the point at which you should have designed it in, not after the fact. All right, I took a lot of time with that, but I, I thought that was important. We need to think about these phases because um, again, the way you screw up a PowerPoint is that you open up the software at the very beginning without thinking about anything and you just start filling in slides. The way you do a presentation correctly is that you go through the process. You plan it out, you think ahead of time, you brainstorm, then you write, then you produce, and then you uh, uh, assemble the things together. So at each point of these uh, phases, you have the opportunity to ask yourself, is this the right choice? Could I do better? Can I replace it? Am, am I in going on, am I resolving my problems? And that is what's important, uh, that you have a workflow process that you get used to and that you continue to iterate on. Now I mentioned brainstorming. This week we're going to start working on our main presentation. So uh, you're gonna go through a brainstorming phase. I want you to generate ideas for the presentation. You're not gonna make the presentation this week, you're gonna make it next week. But this week I want you to do all the hard thinking, all the research, the, uh, the pre-production work that has to go into making a presentation. So this week's assignment, the uh, plan, is the result of your brainstorming. And there are actual rules for brainstorming, so let's go through that right now. Rule number one, postpone and withhold your judgment of ideas. This is the most important thing. People stop brainstorming too soon, and they shut themselves off from a lot of ideas. We don't know exactly how it is that ideas sort of emerge from the back of our mind. You know, memory, uh, the subconscious is a little bit mysterious to us, but we know that there's a lot of creativity in there and that if you address it right and you give it time, that it will flow forth. So the whole point is to brainstorm long enough that you're generating lots of ideas and don't just stop too soon. Rule number two, encourage wild, exaggerated ideas. If there's ever going to be a point to be crazy, it's in this brainstorming phase. And there's something about expanding the box, generating wild, crazy ideas that does something and, and, and creates a lot of other fluid ideas that come forward. So it isn't that we're looking for crazy ideas. It's that thinking about that then creates a chain reaction in which other really good ideas come forward. It's like breaking a log jam or something like that. Mixing a lot of metaphors here, but uh, rule number two, encourage wild, exaggerated ideas. It helps to create more good ideas. And rule number three, quantity counts to stage, not quality. So again, just because you've got three good ideas doesn't mean you can stop. Keep going, push yourself. Push yourself in whatever brainstorming phase you normally do, go a little bit further than, than, than you're comfortable, than you're used to. It's going to make you a better artist. Now these next two rules uh, we're not going to deal with this month because you're all working alone. You're working on your own on your own project, but eventually you're going to be working in a creative team uh, in the working world, and you're going to be brainstorming as a group. And these next two rules deal with that. So rule number four: build on the ideas put forth by others. If you're working in a creative team, you guys are not in competition you're helping each other. So if someone else puts forth an idea and you have a revision or another take on that, put that forward. You're not competing with that person, you're helping the team to go forward. And uh, in group brainstorming, that really is the most um, proactive way to go forward, is that someone states something, someone else restates it, someone else reframes it or, 
or thinks of it a different way. And each time uh, you get a little more information, you get a little more clarity on what you should be doing. And rule number five, every idea and every person has equal worth. You may be the lowest person on the totem pole at your production company, but if you have the best idea and you're involved in a brainstorming session, then that idea is gonna to flow to the top. Um, whether or not you get credit for it is about the, uh, how fair life is at the organization you're at. But people are gonna know if you had the best idea or not. And it's a great way to uh, uh, get ahead in an organization to uh, get the attention of other people is to have the most creative idea when you're in a group uh, brainstorming and you wanna be able to respect everybody at that table because they all deserve to be there. So those are the rules for brainstorming. I want you just to keep them at heart and I want you to engage in that when I get to talking about the assignment for the week. But before I get to the big assignment this week, I wanna talk about the discussion board. The discussion board is about something else. It's about how do you transfer your own passion? People get inspired by different things. Some people get inspired by art or movies or books. Other people get inspired by video games or sports. Everybody likes something different. But if you have a passion that is built up within you and you wanna tell people about this, what are the tools you can use to spread that passion? Now we're really talking here about using our voice to communicate a passion to other people. How can you do that? That's an interesting topic. And this week's discussion board is called Emotional Storytelling. It's gonna take a, a few minutes for me to get through it, but I think you're gonna find this to be a really interesting uh, assignment. And uh, you're gonna be, find, uh, um, you're gonna find that it's really valuable to you. So if you go into the um, setup for emotional storytelling this week, you're gonna find that there are a couple of videos here we want you to watch. First one is a TED Talk. Uh, I don't believe anybody chose this one. I, I, as I remember from the grading, I don't recall anybody, but if you did, you've already seen it, you'll know that it's pretty terrific. But Julian Treasure is telling us how to speak so that people want to listen. He's telling you how to use your voice to be your authentic self, to pass your true truth along. And he defines something that he calls HAIL, H-A-I-L. It stands for honesty, authenticity, integrity, and love. And he means that you can use your voice to connect to other people and they can discover those qualities in what you have to say, that you're giving your truth to other people. Um, now, there are those among us, probably great actors who can fake things, but most of us have trouble lying. If you try to lie, people will see, because you just can't voice things the same way if you're not believing what you have to say. So when you are telling people the honest truth, when you are giving people something from your heart, there's something in your voice that connects with other people and that they know that that's the truth. You know, that's why we kind of avoid people like used car salesmen because we know that that's their job to kind of lie to us. And so they, they have this sort of easy way of talking, but you know, we're always wary of them because we realize that uh, we're not necessarily gonna get the real truth from them. When you want to hear the truth from someone, you can hear it in their voice. And um, in order to communicate that passion, Julian Treasure identifies something that he calls the vocal toolbox. These are techniques that are available to all of us that we can use to try to communicate that passion a little more strongly. And they're very simple things. They're just ways of talking that you can practice on. And you don't want to overdo this. You don't want to sound phony. You don't want to be not yourself. You simply want to use these techniques to enhance your own truth. So we have a, uh, a short video that, that accompanies this that really just goes through the elements of the vocal toolbox. But the vocal toolbox are things like speaking faster or slower. Well, what does that mean? Well, if I speak really fast, it means that I'm excited. You know, people who speak fast are really on fire about what they're talking about. 
And conversely, if you speak very slowly, it might mean that you're sad or you're pensive or that you're dealing with some kind of heavy uh, emotional content. So the merely speaking, speeding up and slowing down your voice a little bit can convey emotion. You can have a high pitch at the end of your sentence that sounds like a question. It sounds like you're asking someone to, to respond. You can have um, uh, pauses in your speech. You can have a dramatic pause. People will hang on waiting for you to say things. So you don't want to just simply race through reading your narrative. Uh, you want to be able to speak it at a normal tone and slow up on purpose and uh, or slow down on purpose and speed up on purpose. And uh, you also can have pauses and phrases where you're more or less uh, pointing out the commas and periods in the written text. You want that variable notion of speech. It makes you sound more authentic. Now, these are not things that you're going to master overnight, but they're things that you can try out for the first time this week. So we're not expecting anybody to have some great epiphany. We just want you to start engaging this and thinking about it. And if you play around with it, uh, each time you do some kind of vocal reading, you get better and better and better. The more you do it, the better you become. And uh, um, I just want you to speak with confidence, feel like uh, what you say is being heard by other people, is being understood, and, and uh, in effect, uh, being felt by them as well. So the vocal toolbox are things that we can play around with. I'm not expecting anybody to have, you know, um, any uh, great change in the way they speak this week. I just want you to start playing around with it, identify that notion, and be aware of it as you do further vocal readings. So the actual instructions for the uh, assignment here is this PDF that we can download here. And we can see that uh, there's a lot of information in here. And the actual assignment is using the vocal toolbox and concepts of hail, tell your audience a story centered around a piece of media that resonates with you. This can be a movie, a song, video game, painting, sculpture, book. The options are endless. So what I want you to do is think about a book that you read or a movie that you saw or a video game that you played that had a profound impact on you. Now don't, don't get hung up on, is this the greatest movie I ever saw? It doesn't have anything to do with greatest or worst or anything. It has to do with how it affected you. This is a personal story that I want you to tell about your encounter with the media. So oftentimes, there might be a song that you heard when you're, you fell in love with your boyfriend or a song that reminds you of your grandfather who passed away recently. So it's a song that evoke, uh, it's a piece of media that evokes a memory or is attached to a moment. Uh, it could be a video game or a, a, a sports game. You know, if you're, if you're very much into, uh, you know, football and there's a particular, you know, uh, game in which it was a play that just electrified you. It's a moment that you'll always recall. That's a profound passion and you want to try to pass that along. So you're just telling a short story. It's two to three minutes long. It has to be audio. You're using your voice to tell the story. So nobody gets to write it out. You can write it out if you want as a prelude to voicing it. But what you're going to post in the discussion board is audio. So we're, we want you to put up what we're calling an audio visual project. And it has to be audio. It can also be video, meaning that that's optional. And for most of you, that might be what you want to use. And we have a page here talking about some of the options you could do. Now, the very easiest way to do this is to really just use your camera on your phone or your computer and use a webcam and talk straight into it as a talking head. So you're actually making a video. I would carry your voice. 
It also puts you on camera. Now, if you don't want to be on camera, then you can just strip the audio off of that. But if you, if you want to be on camera, then you're actually able to use your vocal, uh, not only your vocal inflections, but your uh, facial expressions, your eye contact, perhaps even hand movement uh, to help tell that story. So you have to figure out some way that you're going to capture your uh, story on audio or video. And then you're gonna post it in the discussion board. And if I go back to the discussion board, you'll note that our discussion board actually has the ability to embed a lot of these media types. And I have uh, on the discussion board put in a couple of examples so that uh, I, I think they're most helpful that you can make for people. The first example I'm gonna show you is a webcam video. That's the easiest thing to make. So if you've got a video camera on your laptop um, or your phone, you can do this as it, easily with the phone. Uh, then talking straight into it and telling your story is the easiest way to do it. And uh, this first piece was posted on YouTube and then linked back in the discussion board. And because it was hosted on YouTube, you have the familiar YouTube um, uh, playback system here. So there, there are a couple of ways to embed video and I'm gonna to talk to you about putting it into the discussion, uh, discussion box here. But there's tools here for embedding putting in images, putting in video, putting in audio, and so forth um, into the discussion board. This first piece I'm gonna show you, uh, Andrew is gonna just turn on his webcam, stand in his room and talk about it. Now, when you turn on the webcam, you're responsible for everything the camera sees. So you wanna make sure that that shot is clean, that there's not something weird or uh, we shouldn't see in the background. You don't wanna have your mother uh, ironing clothes on the corner or anything like that. It's, it's good if you can control your space. Now I know a lot of you don't have a lot of control over your space. So it's, it's, it's a good idea to think about, you know, where you might record this. Uh, Andrew has his own room here and, and he's able just to stand freely and talk. So I want to show a couple of clips of this. He, he's talking about the, the original Superman with Christopher Reeves. Let me play this. So Superman the movie, uh, that movie was made in, or was released in 1978. I think the first time I actually sat down and watched that movie, uh, I had to have been like five or six years old in that time area. Now, aside from things like great acting performances and casting, amazing technological leaps and bounds and filmmaking, having basically three separate movies in one single movie, aside from those things that I, that I would generally say are reasons why it's my favorite movie, the reason that I feel such an emotional connection to it, um, goes back to my dad. When I was little, when I was that little, uh, my dad was in the Navy and he was away overseas on deployment for long, for really long periods of time. And so unfortunately it was during those sort of formative years in my life, in my childhood, that my dad wasn't there, he wasn't around. Um, so I was sort of lacking that father figure role model. I guess I sort of found that through this movie um, and through the character of Clark Kent. And so, so uh, this video is embedded in, in the discussion board. You can watch the whole thing on your own if you like. It's enough to get a sense of it. So all Andrew had to do is set up his camera and talk in front of it. And, uh, you know, he had it set up at a, at a height where he could just be standing there. He wasn't in a chair or anything. Now, you'll notice also that Andrew has some video editing skills. And he cut in clips of the movie to help explain what he was saying. If you have video editing skills, feel free to do that. But don't think you have to. I'd be happy with just the straight uh, webcam cut because that's what's important, you telling your story. If you know how to uh, add other material to it then, and you want to do it, you feel free to do that, but you don't have to. Uh, but th this is the easiest way to do this is to create uh, a, a video straight from your, your, your computer or your phone and then upload it and just tell your story straight. Now, if you do this with a phone, uh, you're likely to use vertical video. That's fine. That's in our discussion board, okay. Um, make sure that you've locked the camera, you've locked the phone somewhere. Don't hold the, 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 uh, the phone freely in your hand and move it around because that creates really bad video. So uh, for a lot of people that are, have trouble at home uh, finding a, a, a free space, 
like maybe it's noisy where you are or you've got a lot of uh, uh, other people in the house and, or uh, whatever that you can't control. A space that people do have that they can control that, that uh, actually is a good place to record is your car. Uh, now, I don't want anybody to try recording while they're, talk, while they're driving, but if you're parked in your car and you're sitting in your car and there's no one else in there, then that's a good acoustical space. Uh, there isn't going to be a lot of noise. And if you're sitting in the driver's seat, you can just sort of uh, position the phone right against the steering wheel and lock it there so that it doesn't move and get a pretty good headshot. So uh, if you're using your phone to do this, then that might be the best way to do it. Uh, or any way that you can lock the phone, you know, in a, in a, a, a position where you're not touching it uh, while you're recording, then that'll work fine. Uh, and then getting the video out of your phone onto the uh, discussion board, uh, there are a number of options. A lot of times, if you're shooting with your, your, uh, your phone or something like that, there may be a way to upload it directly to YouTube. So if you're directing, loading directly up YouTube, uh, th this embedding feature is exactly what we're talking about. Uh, there's, a, there's a tool here to embed and you get the embed code from YouTube or Facebook or Vimeo or wherever you want to uh, put something, SoundCloud, and you can embed the uh, option straight from the other website. Um, or you can have actual video, uh, an MPEG-4 file that you upload and drag and drop straight on. Uh, so if you wanted to, download video and put it straight on our servers, then you would just actually have to have the, the MPEG-4 file local. It has to be an MPEG-4 file. It cannot be an AVI or any other kind of video. It can't be a QuickTime MOV. It has to be MPEG-4 uh, for this to work. If it's, if it's any other kind of media, it will work, but you just will attach it. It will be attached instead of embedded. So here's an example of audio only, and again, if you're putting in an MPEG-3, it has this nice cool player that plays it in line. Um, and this audio is from uh, Jim. He's talking about a Bruce Springsteen song that gave him a very powerful sense of deja vu when he heard it. And so he has to explain uh, the setup before he actually gets to talking about what the song is. Let me, let me play a little bit of this. I remember getting to work a little late that day. I don't remember why I was late. Maybe I had an errand to take care of on the way to work, or I was just running behind. My office was on the top floor of a six-story building, so I took the elevator up and walked off onto a floor which should have been loud and bustling on a Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock. The first thing I noticed, though, was that it was eerily quiet, and just about everyone was gathered over in the corner, staring up at TV monitors that usually showed business news and stock quotes on repeat. I saw one of my friends towards the back of the crowd and I asked him what was going on. I hadn't listened to the radio on the way to work and I hadn't seen the TV that morning at all. He said to me, two planes crashed into the World Trade Center this morning, not looking away from the TV monitor, which I just noticed showed two familiar buildings with black smoke pouring out of them. So before he can start talking about the song, he has to tell you about his, first, his memory of 9-11. 9-11 is one of those uh, searing events that everybody knows where they were when they first when when they first found out about it and first heard about it. Uh, a lot of you may be too young to have 9/11 memories, but believe me, everyone who who lived through it was, you know, um, aware remembers that. And even back to my generation, people who lived through John F. Kennedy getting shot always know always remember exactly where they were when they heard that news. And you know, it goes back even further. In your grandparents or your great grandparents' generation, they knew where they were when they heard that Pearl Harbor was bombed. So if it's a major life event, people tend to have these like permanent memories of where they were and what they were doing when they heard it. And so um, Jim, when he first heard this Bruce Springsteen song, which is about firefighters in the 9-11 towers working to save people, when he first heard it, he just had this powerful moment of deja vu and he needed to tell you that in order to set up his story. So let's just show that there are lots of different ways of telling stories. Now, if you want to record audio only, there are tools on your phone that can do that. The voice memo can do that. Uh, if you're on your laptop, there's a, a, a 
um, free audio editor that uh, uh, we recommend called Audacity. And we'll give you links to that. But Audacity uh, can record audio very quickly and very easily uh, and, and uh, export it for uploading and so forth. So all you really need is an audio only file. You don't have to have video if you don't want to. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy for any way that works for you. Now, if you want to do a presentation style uh, media, we're recommending something called Adobe Spark. Adobe has a free website that you have to register. You need to sign up just to have your own space on it. It's free. But once you do it, you can create what they call videos. And there are short presentations that include audio and images. And the images come from the Adobe Creative uh, uh, site. So they're really high quality. And it's a really easy to use system. So um, we highly recommend this for everybody. Uh, PowerPoint is a little bit of overkill for this. And PowerPoint doesn't play embedded in the uh, discussion board. So you, while you can use PowerPoint to do this, uh, assignment it's not it's not ideal but spark is really terrific and if you're interested at all I highly recommend that you check it out and here's an example of uh, what a spark video looks like you'll you'll kind of recognize that um, the pattern uh, and this is again Danielle is going to tell us about her favorite movie but first she has to set up a little bit about who she are who she is Everybody has a different way to tell their story. I think we all can agree that middle school is pretty awkward. It's filled with awkward preteens and their awkward bodies navigating their awkward social cliques. But despite all of that awkwardness, it's in these fragile middle school years that children really begin to piece together who they are and what they care about. It's in middle school where self-esteem seems to be teetering on a tightrope, waiting for a strong gust of wind to push it to one side or the other. And this issue of self-esteem was no different for me. It was in middle school that I realized that I did not fit in with the other girls in my class. I was all about basketball while they were all about nail polish. I hated skirts, but they were all into skirts. The effort that it takes to put on makeup depresses me, but the time crunch never seemed to bother the other girls in my grade. I knew that the things that my peers were turning to was not authentic to me, but I still felt the pressure to conform. I was a tomboy, and in many ways I still am, and in middle school that can be difficult to grapple with. I didn't fit into the socially constructed definition of a girl. I never got the guy. I never dressed up. I hate wearing heels. But one thing I did know was that I was in love with the game of basketball. It was in the seventh grade when I first saw what would become my all-time favorite movie, Love and Basketball. It was finally a movie for the tomboy. A movie in So again, I'll let you watch the whole thing on your own, but you get a good sense of what um, Adobe Spark can do. It can throw up images, slides, connected to the audio. It records your audio and it exports it as an MPEG-4 uh, video file. So this is a video file that's been lo loaded directly onto our server. And this is the playback uh, menu that, that you see. So all of those options are, are, are freely available. You can use anything else you want. And if something doesn't uh, embed, Again, you can just attach it to your message. So there are a lot of ways to put your file up. Uh, I did one as well. So I did my favorite, uh, one of my favorite movies. That's a John Ford movie uh, with uh, John Wayne in it called The Quiet Man. And it's an audio only file. So it's just a, a, a audio playback. But because you can also upload pictures by themselves, there's a little picture icon here. And if you just put a JPEG or a uh, a GIF in there, uh, it'll upload. I chose to put in the uh, movie poster so you know a little bit about the movie that I'm talking about. So you can use anything. Uh, you can uh, do an audio only piece and put up the video game you're talking about, or you can put up a picture yourself or anything that you need to put up for context. So feel free to add audio, uh, add, add video, even or add images if you, even if you don't want to use video or you don't want to be on camera. But all of those options are available. Anybody who needs help technically working on any of this stuff, uh, feel free to get a hold of me. Uh, but we want you to um, um, pick something 
and get it up as soon as possible. We're gonna give you till Friday to get this done, give you a little bit more time. But the earlier you get it up, the more you're gonna get feedback because everyone has an obligation to put up their own audio visual post. That's what we're calling the initial post. And then you have to have two replies. So once you created your own piece, you can come back and you can see what your classmates did and you can respond to them. And there are two different ways that you can respond. You can talk about how they used hail in their voice. So you can, you can have a discussion about vocal techniques or you can, you can uh, bond on their choice of media. If someone else put in uh, Final Fantasy VII as their favorite video game, and that's your favorite video game, then you guys can talk about that. So um, people are gonna be putting in uh, you know, their favorite books and their, their favorite songs and whatnot. You, you, you can engage with people on their choice of media. Um, again, don't fret too much over picking the, the choice of media. Just make sure you choose something that allows you to tell a story around it. The story is what we're interested in, not the piece of media that you actually chose. That makes sense. So uh, that's emotional storytelling. Uh, get it in as soon as possible. But I'm, I'm going to give you extra time past mm -hmm. Wednesday. So, but uh, no, nobody wait till Sunday because then no one has a chance to respond to you. So definitely try to get it up by Friday. And then the, the main assignment this week: planning a presentation. So this is about the presentation that we're working on all month, and that presentation. Uh, if we download the instructions for it, uh, we can see that here's the instruction for the assignment, the presentation. Um, what is the presentation? Well, the topic is, and it's very briefly here, it's your plan to pitch yourself to a future employer. It, it, expanding on this, imagine that you've graduated from full sale. You've already, you, you, you've gotten, You've gone to full sale, you studied what you came here to study, you gained all that knowledge. Now you're ready to go for the job you've always wanted all your life. So this is a presentation that you're gonna make. You're projecting yourself into the future. I don't want anybody to talk about the present tense or what you plan to do. I want you to imagine that you're doing this in the future. So I want you to choose the company that you wanted to work for all your life. Disney, Google, Apple, Pixar, uh, Blizzard, um, whatever that company is, I want you to make a short three to four minute presentation telling them who you are and what skills you have. So you're really telling them the story of who you are. And again, it needs to be a story, beginning, middle, and end. The beginning is how you became interested in becoming a cinematographer or a 3D animator or a, a creative writer, whatnot. And the middle is the skills that you acquired, the journey that you went on. And all, each of you has your own different journey. Some of you joined the army. Some of you, you know, went into a career and, you know, uh, had a life for 20 years and now you're coming back to study this and, and, and change careers. Whatever your story is, you need to tell that because it makes you uniquely who you are. But an important part of the middle is how you gained your skills. So you're gonna talk about your time here at Full Sail. And I want everybody to at least address a couple of classes that you took that were really important to you. And I realize you haven't taken them yet, but again, this is part of the planning that you're going to be doing. Uh, everyone can go to the Full Sail website and see exactly what classes they have to take in uh, to, to graduate. So if you have never done this, this is a great time to do this. I'm, I'm gonna do this right now. Some, somebody in chat, uh, give me a degree program and I'll just follow it out. So somebody type something. Game art, all right, that's fine. That's a good choice. So if I choose games, and then again, under our uh, uh, Game Art Bachelors, that web page is gonna take me down here. If I follow it down, I see two course schedules. There's a campus schedule and there's an online schedule. So the 29 month online bachelors, if I click on that, it's gonna tell me every single class that I have to take before graduation. 
Note that you're all here in on number one, create a presentation. And so as you look through this, when you give me your presentation, I don't want you just to read off a list of six classes that you took. Don't give me just the titles. I want you to pick one or two titles, one or two classes, and tell me what you learned from it. Tell me, you know, in what skill that is really important to who you are that you really uh, loved. You know, maybe it's environmental art. Maybe you learned to sculpt trees and landscapes and waterfalls, and that's what you want to do for a living. And, and, and now you've gotten really good at it. You've got a great examples of it in your portfolio, et cetera. So as you look through the classes that you're going to take for your degree, and each one of you, again, can come to the fullsale.edu website and check that out. You're going to tell me a little bit about uh, the classes that you took. So let's look at this uh, instruction here. You, you're responsible for giving me a plan for your presentation this week. This is a written document. It's basically notes. It doesn't have to be anything really formal. You don't have to write it up. It's not really the high requirement that you had this week with the TED Talk. Uh, but there are five items in here that I want you to very much address and give me the answer to. Most important one, identify your target audience. That is, who is going to hire you? What is the company that you want to go seek a job from? And if possible, who at that company are you going to be talking to? Uh, you may not know that level of detail, but if you know the company, I want you to tell me what you know about that company, not because you're going to include that in your presentation, but that I want to know that you know who they are. Do you want to work for Blizzard because you love World of Warcraft? Well, do you know what you know where Blizzard is? Do you know what it's like to work there? Have you read articles about it? You know, do you know the company culture? Do you know whether you'd fit in or not? These are the kinds of things that I want you to kind of research if you've never even thought about it. And if you've never even thought about who you'd like to work for, well, this would be certainly a great time to do that. And a lot of it can be very specific. Uh, and maybe you're, maybe you don't ever want to move and you've decided that you want to become a recording engineer. And so when you graduate, you'd certainly like to get a job as a recording engineer, but you don't even know what studios there are in your area. Well, this would be a great week to spend a little bit of time to find out what audio production facilities there are in your area that you might be able to go get a job from. And even without meeting them or knowing them, if you just research them and find them, maybe that can become your target market. So you have a practice of making a pitch to them to get a job. So you don't have to pick somebody famous. When we say dream employer, everybody's got a different dream. So uh, whatever it is you want to do, uh, there are an awful lot of people that work at a large company right now and they want to work in a different division of that company. And so they pick the, their own company, but they make a pitch to say, I want to get out of the sales department and I want to be in the design department, that kind of thing. That works, but you need to tell me who it is you're gonna to pitch to and what it is you know about them. And then you're telling a story. You're telling the story of who you are, of what your brand is, of what your skills are, of why you're going to be valuable to this company. So in telling that story, I wanna know the beginning, middle and end. And as you read these instructions, in the beginning, who are you and why are you on this path? What drew you, what are your influences? You know, if you're wanting to be a video game designer, you're probably going to say, I started playing Nintendo when I was age three and moved from here to here to here. And so your engagement with games and consoles is probably part of the story of your growing up, uh, your beginning, your origin story. If you're a musician, you know, what is, maybe you started off with an instrument. Maybe you started off listening to certain kinds of music. Maybe your parents were into certain kinds of music. What are the influences that you had? Uh, in the middle, this is where it's going to vary for a lot of people. If you've had other careers, if you had other elements that, of what you're doing in your life that make you who you are, that's important. Don't leave it out. But then you also want to talk a little bit about your schooling. And it's not just full sale. Maybe you learned things in high school. Maybe you went to another college ahead of time. Uh, maybe you had you know, some other different career. Uh, everything that made you who you are, that's what goes into the middle. And the end, what we call the call to action, I want you to address the company directly, stand up there, 
talk proudly about who you are and what you've accomplished and that you want to join their team. You know who they are. You feel like you would work well together. Now, this is all projecting into the future, which means you get to make up an awful lot of stuff. You haven't graduated from any of these classes, but I want you to talk about the classes you took, and I want you to talk about the portfolio work that you created. You haven't created it yet, but if you're a game designer, you're gonna say that you created some games while you were in school. So invent those, talk about them. Maybe you worked in a team. Maybe uh, you did a, an action scroller, or you did, a, you did an adventure game, but create it. And you're gonna have a lot of leeway here. You're gonna be able to use work that you found on the internet that you can pretend to be yours. Anybody, any artwork that you use that isn't your own, you have to credit it as a credit source. But in terms of telling a story, if you wanna be a 3D animator and you wanna show some 3D animation like you're going to be creating, you can pick an image off the internet and say, this, this is something I created, this is part of my portfolio. That's a necessary part of your presentation because in convincing your employer, your dream audience, of who you are, you have to show them some evidence of work that you created. And we're gonna imagine doing some stuff. And some of you may not be doing this straight off graduation. Some of you may decide that if you really wanna work for, uh, you know, Rockstar Games, that maybe you need to work at one or two other smaller game companies first and then work your way up. And so that'll be part of the story that you have to tell. You can all invent the story, but make sure that it's believable. I don't want to hear people talking about the Grammys they were, they won or the, the records they did with Beyonce. That's a not a believable, you know, uh, path. Maybe it'll happen for you and I'm, I hope it does, but you cannot make that part of your plan. Now, that's that's the, uh, the cherry that comes without uh, knowing that it's going to happen. So um, I know I've talked about all about stuff. Uh, the the plans that I get, I'm not really uh, looking for anything really involved. I'm looking for notes here. So a lot of times you're gonna use Microsoft Notes and just kind of do them in outline form. Here's a typical plan. This person wants to work for HBO and that's his target audience. And he's gonna give me an outline form here with lots of bullet points. I want to see ideas filled in here. If you do not have a lot of stuff in your plan, that means you haven't done work this week. That doesn't mean that you're not gonna be able to, that you, you didn't live a life. Now, some people might wanna put it into paragraph form. This is fine. This person wants to work for Netflix and uh, he's, he's, he's got everything down here. His true self, uh, you know, the beginning, middle and end of his story and so forth. Here's an interesting person. She wants to work for Disney. She wants to be a graphic designer for Disney. So she decided to make her plan something that shows off who she is. So she's got all the information that I asked for here, but she's also given me a little bit of illustration of who she is. So you can be creative with this, but this isn't necessarily something you wanna show off and be creative about. Now I mentioned something called mind maps. Mind maps are visual illustrations of outlines, meaning that uh, if, if Word is not a tool that you feel creative in, then uh, something like uh, MindNode or uh, uh, Google, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you links to uh, different mind mapping tools if you feel like you wanna try them out and use them. But they give us the same information. This is a person who wants to work for Blizzard and they're telling us uh, about their true message. They're telling us about the target audience, Blizzard. They're telling us the beginning, middle and end of their story. So we have lots of bullet points here, lots of visual, individual elements. Each one of these had to be brainstormed and written down that's what I want. So if you're someone who's going to do your brainstorming on paper, if you're going to write it in a sketchbook or do things by hand, uh, I will allow some people to turn that in, but it has to be legible. If, there's, if, if you think I can't read your handwriting, then I know I can't read your handwriting. I'm going to need you to type it up. But here's somebody who did their brainstorming on post-it notes. You know, you know he's being creative here because he's just writing stuff on, putting it on the wall, et cetera. And when he got it all done, he just took a photograph. Now I was happy to accept this because I can read every single word here. But if your notebook is chicken scratches, I don't want you turning it into me. I want you to type it up. 
But if you if I can read your writing, I don't need you to type it up. You can just give me a digital file. But uh, for the most part, I think most of you are going to be working on your phones, on your laptops. Uh, there's no reason not to just go ahead and type it from the beginning. But again, here's another great example of a mind map. Uh, there's, this person going for the Bethesda games. And you can tell there's a theme here. There are only so many game companies. Everybody wants to work for them. Um, uh, you guys should want to work for Epic. There's an awful lot of uh, full sale folks that, are, that uh, work at Epic nowadays. Uh, and they're cleaning up the world. Um, so uh, I have examples here and I'd be happy to share examples of different formats of plans, but you should just make the plan that makes the most sense for you. The, the important part is that you address each of these topics. Identify your target markets, tell me the beginning, middle and end with multiple bullet points, multiple ideas about what you're going to say about yourself. Talk about your main brand. When we say, what is your big idea? We mean, what is your brand? I'm a computer animator. I'm a game designer. I'm a cinematographer. I'm a, a, a writer of uh, um, Dungeons and Dragons fiction. Whatever it is that you're going to be, that's what you're gonna tell us about your brand, about who your idea is. And then think about your star moment. This is not as important, but it is something that you can think about and put in there. So these are the topics and however you get them to me, it needs to be written and turned in by Sunday. So um, I'm gonna open it up for questions. I know I've sort of talked about a whole lot of stuff and maybe uh, confused some people, but uh, anybody that's got a question, I'm gonna open it up. Uh, you can type a question in the chat box or you can, you can uh, unmute yourself and just ask a question. Uh, Anybody uh, feel like they need some clarification on anything? Is anybody still here? Edgar's still here. Hey, Aaron. All right. Okay. So, uh, anybody got a question about either assignment? I'm gonna be around all week. Uh, anytime something's confusing, just shoot me a question, ask me. Uh, I'm gonna post some examples of things that I, if I can. Uh, so, um, we'll, uh, Aaron's raised his hand. So, Aaron, I'm gonna unmute you. Aaron, I'm trying to unmute you. Um, can you unmute yourself? Oh, there you go. I hear you. Is that better? Yeah, yeah, you're good. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I had a question regarding last well i know this entire course would be it's more our this entire course would be ex, ex, pretty much expressing ourselves through presentations but more importantly we're proactively gaining knowledge as we create create these presentations one thing that really came to mind of how we're doing this exactly is i know each of us will ha probably have different ideas of what are, we're going into our careers some may have different skills from high schools or what they've learned from side jobs and as for me i'm planning to go a multi prep so one thing that's been on my mind is whether considering um the networking that we're going to be presented when, when we're doing presentations to people in the future um so you want to be able to present to your classmates if that's possible and few, and other staff and if I, and other staff if that if that's okay well uh we are going to share our presentations the main presentation uh in the discussion board in week three and four but we also have the ability to come back into this um zoom uh uh, uh 
technology and I can give you your desktop and you could present to the class in the final Zoom if you like. Oh, so okay. think about that. Uh, your, your first draft is going to be due at the end of week three. And our first, our, our week four Zoom class is going to be on Monday afternoon. And so if you wanted to present to your classmates, you could present your first draft uh, live in class. And I think that would be a terrific experience. Most kids are too afraid to do that. But if you, if you want to do that, I think it would be a terrific thing to do. Thank you. So we'll have that possibility, absolutely. And if uh, and, and nevertheless, you'll be sharing with everybody in the discussion board uh, when we get to there in, in week three and four. Uh, thanks, that's a great idea. Uh, anybody else have a question? Uh, yeah, Ofat, your, um, your mic's open. Hey, hi, how are you guys? How's, how's everyone? Uh, my question is, when I read the chapters, it said about um, the presentation, it's storytelling. My question here, like I would, like if we uh, like I'm in college and my professors told me that give a presentation about certain chapter. How can I put the information in a story? Does it have to be a story also? Yes, you can put anything into a story. Um, a story, when we say um, story, we mean a format that has beginning, middle, and end on it. And beginning, middle, and end means that as you set it up, you say what the issues are. So if you were to do a, a report on a, a chapter, your, your beginning would be something along the lines of, uh, you know, I was asked to give my opinion about this, uh, this chapter. It goes into these themes. And then the middle is the complications, the things that you learned or you had to deal with. And the final takeaway would be how you felt about it all. So it would be the experience of reading that chapter and the things that you learned from it. So it would be the story that you would tell. Does that make hey, sense? What, what if I would need like to explain it? Like, like, like I'm a teacher and I'm telling the student the information about that chapter. There's like reporting in it also, isn't it like that? Oh, absolutely, yes. Oh, I see, okay. So that would be, yeah, that would be part of the beginning where you're explaining this is the chapter that I'm talking about. I got you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Sure. Uh, anybody else got any questions for me? I know we've been going on a long time. I don't want to be uh, too uh, oppressive on your time here. No, we haven't only gone an hour and a half, so. Uh, but anybody has any questions later in the week, uh, I'll be available. Get a hold of me. And um, anybody has any difficulties with hosting your media, uh, I can help with that as well. Uh, I know uh, I, I didn't go into heavy detail on uh, how these things work, but uh, in the discussion board, Essentially, you start to write a post, you have to put some text in, and then you can embed media after you've written something. So you can just say, here's my emotional story, and then if it's an MPEG-4, you click this button and you drag and drop the video onto that. If it's an MPEG-3, you click this button and you drag the media onto that, and so forth. Uh, if you were embedding from YouTube, you'd click this button and you'd have to have pulled the, the share embed code from the YouTube website and you would drop that code in here and, and that will work. So, um, uh, that's what a lot of people have trouble with is embedding YouTubes, but as long as you put the link in here, I can do the embedding for you. So I'll keep, I keep an eye on, this, on the uh, discussion board and I try to make it as rich as possible. It's a lot more interesting for people if you're seeing stuff in line than if you have to download it and watch it offline and come back. So uh, we wanna make this as fun and as rich, media rich as possible. So, uh, all right, I think that's it for me. If anybody else has any questions, I'll let you guys go. Have a great week. Uh, this is gonna be really fun and I really think you guys are gonna come up with some really terrific emotional stories. So, uh, have a good week. <laughs>